Hello, welcome to the Raven Industries Auto Steer webinar. We're going to be talking about Smart Tracks mostly today, and uh, Smart Tracks and Smart Tracks MD. As you can see from the first view we're looking at, uh, we're talking about both Smart Tracks and Smart Tracks MD. Uh, Smart Tracks is our hydraulic steering solution, so that would either mean we're hooking up to a hydraulic valve that gets installed on a machine. Or in some instances, there's a hydraulic valve that's already installed on a machine from the factory, and we can tie into that in a lot of cases. Uh, the example on the right is the Smart Tracks MD, which is our mechanical drive. That connects to the steering column, and there's an adapter that fits beneath the steering wheel, and that's what's physically turning the steering wheel and, and doing the auto steer. There's some advantages and disadvantages for going for either Smart Tracks versus Smart Tracks MD. Reasons why you might go for the hydraulic side of things. It's a uh, more responsive. A hydraulic valve is always going to be able to be a, just a little bit faster, a little bit more responsive. There will be a little bit less slop in the steering system, and hydraulic system will overcome some of that. Uh, there's going to be no steering column wear. I mean, some of these installations on the Smart Tracks MD system. There's some wear and tear that can happen to the steering column, both because of the installation. In some instances, there's modification that needs to be done to the steering column, especially the enclosure. And in certain instances, beyond that point, just year after year of the system physically turning the steering wheel back and forth, it can cause wear that way as well. Uh, with hydraulics, there's less clutter in the cab. You don't have the mechanical drive unit mounted to the steering column. And for that reason. I mean, it, it's integrated, so there's less things that you have to deal with in the cab. Uh, reasons to go with a mechanical system, though, it's more affordable, just about across the board. The mechanical drive, that type system, is more affordable than a hydraulic system. Also, you can move it from machine to machine. You can get vehicle transfer kits that'll make it so the system is more versatile, being able to buy one kit, basically, and use it different times a year in different machines. Um, also, it works on older machines where we don't even necessarily have a hydraulic kit to connect to. This uh, makes it so we can figure out certain characteristics of the steering column and the steering wheel spline and recommend a system that'll fit in place. And it's also easier and faster to install than it would be for a hydraulic system. Assuming that the system is already installed and calibrated, there are a few fine adjustments that can be done to ensure that the system performs as well as possible. The first one would be online sensitivity. This online sensitivity adjustment takes into account the performance of the system when it's within two feet of the guidance line. So having an online sensitivity value that's too high or too low, it can definitely affect how the machine reacts. As you can see from the video, you can see examples of a machine with online sensitivity being too high, where you can see that it's overreactive. And you can also see an example here of the online sensitivity being too low, and now it feels lazy while it's on the line. The other main fine-tuning adjustment that we have is line acquire aggressiveness. Line acquire mode is active when the machine is further than two feet from the guidance line. Uh, line acquire aggressiveness affects the performance when it's in this mode. Here's an example of having line acquire aggressiveness too high. You can see that the machine tries to pull into the line faster than it should rather than turning in smoothly right at the line. Here's also an example of the line acquire aggressiveness being too low. You can see that the machine drives past the line and then has to come back again rather than driving smoothly to the line. Both the online sensitivity and the line acquire aggressiveness settings can be adjusted one number at a time, and sometimes you'll have a surprising difference by just adjusting that small amount. Additional fine tuning can be done if necessary to the PWM values. The main ones that we have are PWM minimums and PWM maximums for both the left and the right side. PWM minimums take into account small corrections that are done, mainly in online mode. 
if the minimums happen to be too low, the machine will not steer until the, the system realizes that it isn't steering and will start bumping up to higher duty cycles. The PWM maximum values take into account large corrections, mainly during line acquisition mode. If the maxes are too high, it can lead to situations where increasing the duty cycle to the valve or the mechanical drive unit does not necessarily steer the machine any faster than it was before. The question you can see on here is, what happens if the mins are too high? Much like if the online sensitivity setting is too high, you can have situations where online, every small correction that gets made is an overcorrection. It'll be uncomfortable in the cab because the machine will be weaving back and forth very quickly. Steering accuracy and GPS corrections are directly related to each other. Once a steering system is tuned as well as it can be tuned, the only thing that can improve the accuracy is the GPS correction. WAS, or SBAS, for example, will give you a repeatability within 15 minutes of 6 to 9 inches. Once you step up to the next level, which would be GS, you can get down to a repeatability of 2 to 4 inches, and your pass-to-pass -pass accuracy is much, much better especially within those 15 minutes. Once you jump up to the highest level, which is RTK, you have sub-inch pass-to-pass accuracy as well as repeatability. You can come back a week later and you'll have the same accuracy level as you would have within 24 hours. Sub-inch accuracy is only good up to 10 miles per hour. After that, accuracy of the system will still be good but it will gradually degrade as the speed increases. Raven steering and field computers require GPS output to be set up as follows. GGA and VTG must be set to output at 10 Hz, which appears as 0.1 on Raven receivers. ZDA must be set up at 0.2 Hz, or once every 5 seconds, which shows up as 5.0 on Raven receivers. Non-Raven receivers aren't able to necessarily differentiate between outputs, so in some cases, GGA, VTG, and ZDA must all be set to output at 10 Hz. Typical baud rates will be 19,200, but anywhere between there and 115,200 are acceptable. Additional common NEMA messages, such as RMC, which is similar to ZDA, and GSV are not required and do not need to be turned on. In the case of RMC especially, if ZDA is enabled, RMC should definitely not be turned on. Once we've validated that GPS is being output to the system, let's make sure that the SmartTracks node is recognizing that GPS. Taking a look at the diagnostic lights on the node, be sure that Diagnostic 1 light is lit. This indicates that GGA is being received by the node and that the node is satisfied with the GPS. The following slides show examples of how Raven field computers must be set up to work with SmartTrax or SmartTrax MD when using internal receivers. The current screen shows the GPS output screen from a Cruiser 2. If the internal receiver on a Cruiser 2 is being used, the output screen for GPS must look as follows. All of the message sliders must be over to the left hand side. This is due to the fact that the cruiser internal receiver is set to automatically output messages in the way SmartTrax expects. GGA and VTG will be output at 10 Hz and ZDA will be output at 0.2 Hz. Moving into the baud rate screen, you'll see both port A and port B baud rates available, port B baud rate must be set to 115-200 in order for the SmartTrax MD or SmartTrax to communicate with the Cruiser 2. Moving to the Invisio Pro family, it's exactly opposite from the Cruiser. The view on the right shows the GPS output screen. As opposed to the Cruiser, the sliders for GGA and VTG must be set to 10 Hz and ZDA must be set to 0.2. The baud rate to the right must be set to 19,200. 
This will ensure that the SmartTracks is able to detect the GPS coming from the internal receiver on the Invisio Pro. The GPS output screen can only be detected when the GPS source is set to internal GPS receiver. Once the GPS settings have been checked and set as they need to be, go back to the GPS source screen and select internal GPS receiver via tilt or smart tracks. On the Viper 4 family of field computers, we make it fairly simple. We have the option to set for smart tracks on the GPS output screen. This will automatically put GGA, BTG, and ZDA at the point where they need to be. There are additional messages such as GSV and GSA which set to a very slow rate which do pass through the smart tracks and allows the Viper 4 to be able to display additional GPS information. Node mounting is also very important. Whether it be smart tracks or smart tracks MD, the node must always be mounted very securely inside the cab with one of the numbers on the arrows pointing straight forward and another arrow pointing straight down. It doesn't matter which arrow is pointing straight forward and which arrow is pointing straight down. The arrow pointing down will automatically be detected and the arrow pointing towards the front will be entered during the calibration process. Failure to have the correct number pointing forward entered in will cause the system to not compensate for terrain changes accurately. If the terrain compensation needs to be recalibrated, follow these steps. Find ground where tire tracks are visible, drive forward and stop in order to give the system an idea of which direction is forward, press start calibration, once it has recorded the first point, it'll direct you to turn the machine around. So drive forward, turn the machine around in the same tracks, and stop at the same point where you were before, facing the opposite direction. Once the heading or course over ground, left-right position, and fore-aft position all fall within tolerance, which is 3 feet, the numbers on the screen will change color to indicate that they are within an acceptable range. Once this happens, you can finish the calibration, and the 3D terrain compensation calibration will be complete. If the steering needs to be recalibrated, here's a list of things you'll need. Conditions needed for calibrating the system include land that's not slippery, which could mean ice, snow, or mud, not rocky, which can cause bumps, and not especially hilly due to the fact that the machine can speed up and slow down excessively during the calibration. Also, if it applies to the machine being calibrated, the booms must be racked, and general rule of thumb is to have the machine running at a normal operating RPM. What will happen during the calibration? The machine is going to drive around. It will make hard left and right turns and gradually turn less and less as it learns the conditions of the machine and what is normally going to happen as it gives various outputs. The PWM mins and maxes will be figured out during this calibration process. And with these mins and maxes, now the machine knows how hard it has to turn in different conditions. Assuming that the system is working correctly, no additional attention is required. However, if problems do arise, the following checklist can be very useful. If you look at the machine, are there any linkages that are loose, a tire condition, or low tires? or any other mechanical issues that could be causing the steering system in general not to steer very well. Settings such as PWM values, line acquire aggressiveness, or online sensitivity values getting changed. Check over the installation again. Are hoses secure? Is the node mounted securely and properly? Double check the measurements that were entered. Is the antenna height and other offsets entered incorrectly? If no GPS is coming in or other problems persist, look at the lights on the node, making sure that power, GPS, and CAN communications are working as they should. Finally, if the machine won't steer at all, inspect the valve. Make sure that electrical connections to it, as well as hydraulic connections, are secure. Some valves include a feature that allows you to manually actuate it. If the valve can be manually actuated to turn the wheels back and forth, but will not control it electrically, further troubleshooting will be required. 